inventory section of the stability series. Now in this section we'll go through why we even have inventory, the different types of inventory, and how to address it. But before we get started, me and my dog Apple will give you a brief intro into the subject. This is my dog Apple. In addition to being an amazing stunt dog, he's my only friend and he understands inventory very well. In this little demonstration, Apple is a supplier. It's his responsibility to adjust to changing demands quickly. I'm the customer in this example, and like the customer in the real world, I do as I please. The leash between us represents inventory. Through inventory, the customer tells us what particular product is wanted and how much is really wanted. Inventory serves as communication from the supplier to the customer by telling the customer what is available and how much is available. Inventory can be very tricky. While it provides communication between me, the customer, and Apple, the supplier, it is also a form of waste. You may think that you control inventory, but in reality, the customer is the true king of the leash. If you don't agree, imagine if your customer decided to stop purchasing your goods tomorrow. Now do you see who controls inventory? The customer ultimately dictates the fate of your inventory. Back to me and Apple. Notice that I, the customer, dictate the pace and direction in which we travel. Apple, being an expert in inventory, keeps close to me. This way he's able to keep inventory tight and he can feel the constant small signals I send through pace and direction through correcting pulls on the leash. Now imagine if Apple decides to flood the warehouse with inventory in the form of a long leash. He'd get lost and may move in a direction that's different from the way the customer is moving. Remember the new Coke formula introduced in 1985? This was an example of the supplier wandering away from the steady direction the customer was moving. They flooded the warehouses with the new Coke formula and didn't realize it was a flop until the supply chain and all the warehouses were full of it and it all had to be discarded. Notice that with all this inventory between Apple and me, the constant tugs I sent before to correct his direction and pace are now lost in this sea of inventory. He's continuing down this path and has no idea that I've moved on. Your customer sends you consumption signals every day. If you can't feel the tugs on the leash, you have too much inventory. Apple, being an expert in inventory, allows me to bleed down the excess inventory and again establishes a stable level so he can receive the constant signal he needs as a supplier to keep him on the right path. Keep in mind that the leash can't be too short either. This would cause me to send false signals to Apple and he'd falsely correct his path. Inventory, like this leash, should be tight enough to receive signals from the customer, but long enough to buffer against normal market fluctuations. Although inventory is a form of waste, if used properly, it can be a wonderful ally and an excellent form of communication with our customers. So why inventory? Why not slash it all tomorrow? Well, you could, but A, you own all this stuff, and to blindly trash everything would be highly wasteful, and B, even if you were able to get past the death grip of the accounting department, you'd quickly stock out and go out of business. Everyone, even Mighty Toyota, has to carry inventory at strategic points in manufacturing and along the supply chain. I'm sure you've seen this diagram before, but please humor me. The boat carries goods from the supplier to the customer and floats across the sea of inventory. Inventory masks our problems, which are represented by the rocks below. Anything from high setup times to excessive absenteeism can be problems to companies, but can be masked to a degree by high levels of inventory. If you decrease inventory without addressing these issues, you'll run into a rock and sink. Now here are the different types of inventory. When we think of inventory, we generally think of finished goods or work in process that litters the floor. But actually there's six different types. There's finished goods, buffer stock, raw materials, safety stock, shipping stock, and work in process. We'll go through each type in detail. Okay, so back to the paper airplanes we built. This is what it would look like if we were building paper airplanes in a factory where material flowed from left to right represented by the orange arrow at the bottom of your screen. Now I know it's hard to read, so feel free to download the slides if you want to follow along. Each different type of inventory is shown on your screen. Now finished goods inventory is the most commonly noticed. It's also based on customer demand. So if you know with high probability that your customer is going to take five units per day, you'd store five units. And finished goods inventory is that which is stored on the shelf so your customer can go and pick. In this system, we're keeping one of each color in finished goods inventory. This means the customer can walk up and pick any color he wants. As soon as one color is taken, this causes a chain reaction that goes all the way back to raw materials to replace that color. The fact that there's only one of each color in finished goods shows that we're highly confident that no more than that will be desired by the customer at any given time. We're also confident that we can replace it before another of that color is desired. Next we have buffer stock. Buffer stock serves as the emergency storage area for finished goods. So this is to protect the external customer. So when you go to buy a pair of shoes, they might not have your exact size on the shelf, 
but if you ask the employee to go look and back, generally they'll have your size. So that's an example of having buffer stock to protect you, the customer, from a stock out. This is in addition to normal demand, so if we're expecting five units per day to get sold, this would be the extra one or two units that we'd keep in back just in case our demand is a little higher than expected. We're keeping one of each color in buffer stock. This is to protect the final customer from a stock out. Now we're highly confident that the customer will not want more than one of each color at any given time, but who's to say there won't be a sudden spike in demand where two red planes will be needed? Who's to say that the one plane you have in finished goods isn't defective? In either of these cases, the final customer will be given a plane from buffer stock. Keep in mind that buffer stock is not a free buffet. In the rare case that we have to go into buffer stock, I want to know why so I can prevent it from happening again. Next we have shipping stocks, which is finished goods inventory placed in the first in first out lanes or FIFO lanes. If done properly, shipping stocks actually takes a lot of discipline, more so than other forms of inventory. You have to have level pull with your carrier and customer. So if they're expecting five units, those five units have to be placed in proper order for loading and the carrier has to send a truck that fits at least those five units. In this case, there are five reds, four greens, two yellows, and six blues that are ready to ship. Ideally, your shipping lanes will be set in perfect level pull with your customer. So as soon as this ratio of planes is met, at this exact moment, a truck would show up that holds that exact amount of each color. The planes would be loaded in the exact sequence desired by the customer. The customer may not want all the same color in a row. He may want to mix the colors in the exact sequence these are being produced on his production line. This will be addressed more in the Hedjunka series. Next we have raw materials and this is product that you've received from your supplier that you've not manipulated or altered in any way. So if you're a shipyard it would be a raw piece of steel or if you're McDonald's it would be a pack of buns. In this case we're keeping one of each color in raw materials inventory. This is because the supplier is right across the street and is attuned to our rate and level of consumption for each color. It's well known that Dell only keeps two hours of raw materials on their shop floor at any given time. Live feedback to their suppliers that are located nearby is how they keep such a low level of raw materials inventory. Next we have work in process which has been altered by you or manipulated in some way. It's not in its raw state anymore, yet it's still incomplete. It's not in the finished goods state yet. There generally will be a critical amount needed somewhere on the shop floor. We all do want to get to that goal of one piece flow, but in the meantime, to keep operations running smoothly, you're going to have to keep a small amount of whip in certain areas. Work in process along with finished goods are two of the most noticeable types of inventory. In many shops, whip litters the floor and causes safety hazard and ties up valuable capital. But when well controlled, whip can be used to stabilize an otherwise volatile working environment. Whip can be used as a clever way around spending money on capital improvements. For example, I've seen donut shops that use whip along a moving conveyor to cool product. I'm sure some engineer could invent a quick cooling device that would eliminate that whip. But the cost of research and development is not worth the 200 donuts they keep along a cooling line at any given time. Next we have safety stock. Now this is work in process that protects the internal customer. Whereas buffer stock protected the external customer from stocking out, this is the whip that we keep in addition to the normal amount just in case there's an internal spike in demand as opposed to an external spike in demand. So you ask, when could there ever be a spike in internal demand? Well, one example is if you find a defect within some of your whip and it has to be reworked at some other location, you might be out of work at that point. But if you have enough safety stock, that can keep the line running smoothly while they rework those defects. Safety stock should be well segregated from normal whip and raw materials and be well marked on the shop floor. Like buffer stock, safety stock is not a free buffet. I recommend you keep safety stock locked away in some form. Only a team lead should be allowed to take safety stock. In addition to this, data needs to be collected every single time safety stock is used. If you continue to master internal issues with safety stock, you will never improve. So how do we address inventory? The first thing I recommend you to do is absolutely nothing to the inventory. Don't touch it. I understand there's a lot of pressure and a lot of enthusiasm to decrease inventory. You'll get there eventually. But until you understand the underlying causes of why it's there, do not touch it. I've seen Kaizen events where we've actually had to increase inventory until we could get to the root cause of why the inventory was there. You'll get there eventually. You have to do your due diligence, so until you actually understand why the inventory is there, do not touch it. As I mentioned earlier, it would be highly wasteful to discard inventory. It would also be very dangerous to lower your levels without seeing the rocks. 
Take your time and study what's being consumed, how often items are being consumed, and look at the consumption patterns. Then look internally as to what you produce and how frequently you produce items. This is a starting point into seeing the rocks below. Until you can make the numbers make sense at a bare minimum on paper, you should not touch your inventory. The second thing I recommend you to do is isolate areas that are producing inventory. On a shop floor, it can be very confusing where the inventory is coming from. This is especially true when different workstations are mixing their inventory. This is even more confusing when like machines are pushing inventory into a common area. Literally separate out areas by putting out lines, boxes, whatever you need so you can actually do the math around how much inventory is being produced by different areas or different functions. So now that you've done your math on paper and it all works out, this is where the real work begins. In reality, the shop floor is where real data is collected. You'll often find the data that you pull from the system to be inaccurate. Take your time and validate the production rates and inventory counts on the shop floor. Segregating areas and studying at the micro level is where you're going to learn the most about your need for inventory. Also keep in mind that different areas need to hold different levels of inventory. Workstation 1 may only need to hold one of each color, but because Workstation 2 is highly unstable due to excessive absenteeism or production issues, the inventory levels have to be kept higher there. Next I recommend you find out why the inventory is there. So do we have this much inventory in stock because there truly is that much variation in customer demand or was it because we ran out once and the sales rep doesn't like it so we're going to stock 40 times more than we need. The vast majority of the time you'll find that the real answers as to why you're holding so much inventory is something practical rather than mathematical. By practical, I mean a simple reason stemming from a single act of laziness or poor decision making. A series of setups might have gone bad, so instead of getting to the root cause, production management might have decided to keep the inventory levels higher to accommodate the new higher setup times. You'll be amazed when you start digging into why all this inventory is around. Next you need to validate your improvements, and what I mean by this is you need to give it some time to stabilize to see how much inventory you really need to carry to satisfy customer demand. Now this stabilization may take a shift, it may take a month, it may take three months. I don't know, it's different for each organization, but while you're validating, I recommend that you keep a certain amount of safety inventory just in case there is a spike in customer demand. Remember, the customer only cares about getting their product. They don't care that we're doing a Kaizen event and we've run out because we've cut inventory too low. So don't let that happen to you. You're at a vulnerable time when you decide to change inventory levels. You're running closer to the risk of stocking out and lean naysayers are waiting for this to happen. Run your new cell or production line with this new level of inventory. This will prevent anyone from attempting to mix in safety inventory, giving your event a false level of achievement. It's fine to fail during the validation period. In fact, if you don't fail, I'd say you weren't aggressive enough. Be aggressive knowing that your customer will not suffer because of the foresight you had to keep some safety inventory during the validation period. Next, I recommend you decrease slowly. There's going to be a lot of pressure and excitement to slash this inventory in half or even more. But I recommend you proceed with caution and try to take Ono's philosophy when he says decrease and see if you can do it with one less every single time. It's important for you to find that point of failure when keeping just one fewer piece of inventory will cause your system to collapse. But I recommend you do this slowly. If you stock out, you'll have an irate customer on your hands. It also gives your organization one more reason not to continue their lean journey. Take your time and do it right, one unit of inventory at a time. This is yet another example where my buffet analogy applies. Slow down, take down one plate at a time, and don't run back in line while you're still chewing. If you follow this advice, eventually the rocks underneath your once high sea of inventory will smooth out, allowing you to lower your inventory to new lows. If you recall from our waste series, I talked about how we moved from a hunter-gatherer society to an agrarian society, and how this caused more waste. There's some debate as to whether or not hunter-gatherers experience more famine than farmers. Cromac O. Grata wrote a book on the subject called Famine, A Short History. In the book, it says anthropologist Mark Nathan Cohen sees no reason why prehistoric hunter-gatherers would have been undernourished. Paleopathological evidence from skeletal remains suggests that life became harder from the shift from hunter-gatherer to settled farming communities. So in other words, just because we have more inventory in the form of food for certain periods doesn't mean that we'll be better fed on a consistent basis. Here's a story of inventory going bad. There's a Korean barbecue place in Atlanta I love going to that just happens to be a buffet. So how it works is you can order off the menu and get sliced pork, beef, or whatever other kind of meat they're serving. On this day, they did a poor job of managing finished goods inventory, which is cut meat. 
We got impatient and ordered more than we needed, anticipating another shortage. Unfortunately, so did everyone else in the restaurant. That logjam finally flooded out and we were left with more meat than we could finish. The restaurant should have done a better job controlling finished goods inventory and we should have resisted the temptation in causing an artificial spike in demand. The meal concluded with me giving everyone at the table and the waiter a brief lesson in inventory management. We all left unhappy. So here's a brief summary of what we talked about. First we talked about why inventory. Inventory if you recall is one of the seven forms of waste so why not get rid of all of it today? Obviously we've answered why we can't. Next we have the different types of inventory so you're educated as to inventory not just being finished stock and work in process. Next I recommended that you proceed with caution and took you through some basic steps as to how to decrease inventory. And then if you want to learn a little bit about inventory and the bullwhip effect, go ahead and look that up in the glossary. If you're interested in the basics of calculating inventory, I recommend you go to the pull series. 